When the Legends Die by Hal Borland. When the legends die, the dreams end. When the dreams end, there is no more greatness. Section 1. Bessie. Chapter 1. He came home in mid-afternoon, hurrying through the alley. She was sitting on the back step of the unpainted two-room house, peeling willow twigs, twigs with her teeth and watching the boy chase butterflies among the tall horseweeds. She looked up and saw her man come in from the alley, through the horseweeds towards her. His face was bloody, his short turn, and bloody down the front. She clapped a hand to her mouth to stifle the cry of hurt and surprise, and he stepped past her into the house. She followed him, and he gestured her to silence and whispered in the oot tongue, They will come after me, bring water to finish. Get the other shirt. She went outside, filled the tin wash basin from the water pail on the bench beside the door, and brought it to him. She got the other shirt while he washed his face. There was a cut over his left eye and a darkening bruise beside his mouth. He washed his face, then his hands, and gave her the pan of red-stained water. She took it outside and poured it on the ground among the weeds, where it sank into the dry soil and left only a dark, wet spot. When she went inside again, he had taken off the torn shirt and wrapped it into a tight bundle with the bloody places hidden. He pulled the clean shirt over his head, tucked the tails inside his brown corduroys, and said, still in the oot tongue, I shall go to the stream with the black stem ferns on the horse mountain. Come to me there. He went into the other room and came back with the rifle. He tucked the bundled shirt under his arm and went to the door, looked, waited, then touched her face with his free hand and went outside. He hurried through the weeds and down the alley to the place where the scrub oak brush grew close by. He went into the brush toward the river. The magpies screamed for a moment, then were silent. He was gone. She wiped the water from the table where he had spilled it, searched the floor for spots of blood, and wiped the tin basin with the rag. She went outside and put the basin beside the water pail and looked at the place where she had emptied the basin after he washed. The wet spot on the ground was almost gone. She came back and sat on the step again. The boy, who was five years old and only an inch or two so taller than the horseweeds, came and stood at her knee asking questions with his eyes, she smiled at him. Nothing happened, she told him. Nobody came. Nothing happened, remember, if they ask. He nodded. She handed him a willow twig. He peeled the bark with his teeth, as she had done, chewed the bark for a moment, tasting the green bitterness, and spat it out. Go catch a grasshopper, she said, and he went back among the weeds. She waited half an hour. Then they came, up the street and round the house. They came and stood in front of her, the tall man who always came when there was trouble, the short fat one from the sawmill, and Blue Elk, with his squeaky shoes, his black coat and derby hat, his wool-bound braids, his air of importance. She looked up at them, each in turn, and she clapped her hand to her mouth and began to wail, "'You bring trouble!' she cried, then to Blue Elk in the oot tongue. This man is, my man is hurt. The tall man, the sheriff, watched her and said to Blue Elk, see what she knows. Blue Elk rubbed his hands together. They were the soft hands of a man who has not worked for a long time. He said, Bessie, stop the wailing. The wailing is for another woman. Let her make the mourning. My man is not hurt? You know he's not hurt. Where have you hidden him? They both spoke at oot. He is not here. Why do you come here for him? He was here. He came here. If you know this, you then find him. She gestured toward the house. What does she say? The sheriff asked. She says he is not here. She says we should look. The sheriff and the sawmill man went inside. She sat waiting. She asked Blue Elk, Why do you want my man? What happened? He killed a man. Who? Frank, no dear. <laughs> that one? Scorn was in her eyes. I know, Frank was a thief, a no good, but George killed him. What, where did jo George go? She shrugged. The sheriff and the sawmill man came back. No sign of him. What does she say now? Blue Elk shrugged. Nothing. The sheriff and the sawmill man talked in low tones. Blue Elk turned to her again. Where is the boy? She glanced around the weed patch before her eyes met Blue Elk. She waved her hand vaguely. Boys play, go where they will. 
They will watch you, Blue Elk said, still in the tongue. If they want me, I am here. The sheriff turned to Blue Elk. Tell her we'll find him if we have to run down every little bunch of oots in the mountains, every fishing and berry camp. If he was here, he covered his tracks, or she did. Tell her we'll find him, Blue Elk said to her. You heard, for the cost of two horses, I could settle this. I have not the cost of two horses. One horse, Blue Elk offered. She shook her head. I have not the cost of one goat. What does she say? The sheriff asked. She says he did not come here. She says she has not seen him. I think she's lying. My people, Blue Elk said in English, do not lie. The sheriff grunted. They just kill each other over a lunch pail. Some day one of them is going to kill you, Blue Elk. I am an old man who has done much for my people. He's probably hiding in the brush down the river, the sheriff said. He turned to the sawmill man. We better go find Frank's woman. She probably heard by now. And you better tell her you'll pay for the funeral for a coffin, the sawmill man said. Fifty dollars for a coffin, that's all. Blue Elk's eyes had darted to him when the money was mentioned. The woman on the steps saw, and she said to him, Oot, the cost of two ponies. There was scorn in her voice. What does she say? the sheriff asked. She says she is glad it is not her man who was killed. You know where to find Frank's squaw? Blue Elk nodded, and they left. She sat on the steps another ten minutes. Then she said, come now, and there was a movement among the horse weeds near the alley. The boy stood up and came to her, and then he went indoors. She praised him. She walked around the house, choosing certain things, not taking them from their places, but choosing them. The extra box of ammunition for the rifle, the package of fish hooks and the spool of lime, two butcher knives, spare moccasins for herself and the boy, the boy's blue coat, two brown blankets. She sent the boy for kidling, started a fire in the iron stove, and put the piece of meat to boil. She neatened up the house to leave it clean and to occupy the time. It was a company house. The man at the pay desk took money for, from her man's pay every week to pay for rent of the house and for buying the furniture. The old iron bed, the dresser with the broken leg, the four chairs, the table, the stoves. For two years he had taken money to pay for these things, and he said there was still more to pay. By now, she told herself, they had paid for two blankets, and that was all she was taking. The blankets. The butcher's knives were hers from before they came here. She had made the moccasins and the coat. She was no thief. Her choosing done, the house neat, she went outside and sat on the steps again. The boy sat with her, in no mood to play. When the meat was cooked, they would eat. When it was dark, they would pack the things and go. Two years ago, Blue Elk had brought them here from Horse Mountain. Now, in a way, Blue Elk was sending them back to Horse Mountain. She thought of the summer two years ago.